Okay. Dr. Arota, good luck. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are very pleased to have you all for today's um, endocrine grand rounds. Um, we are happy to um, have uh, Dr. Vanita Aroda for uh, to give us uh, this lecture. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce her uh, today. She is the director of diabetes clinical research at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and associate professor at Howard Medical School. Um, she did her training in internal medicine and endocrinology at uh, UC San Diego. Um, she subsequently was um, uh, in San Diego for some time and then uh, moved to Washington, D.C., where she was at uh, uh, MedStar Georgetown uh, and um, in, in, I think in 2009 moved to uh, Boston. She has um, uh, an extensive uh, record of uh, excellent uh, um, clinical um, uh, trial experience. Uh, she has uh, uh, published uh, in a number of uh, these uh, uh, trials uh, involving uh, diabetes prevention and also novel therapeutics and diabetes and uh, weight management. Um, she has um, been involved in large uh, phase three and phase four clinical trials and their applicability uh, and integration into care. Uh, she has um, been one of the uh, lead investigators at NIH funded uh, GRADE study, uh, D2D study and the DPPOS studies. And the, um, it's been a, PI for many uh, clinical trials uh, with uh, uh, several uh, pharmaceutical companies. She also serves as the um, on the practice professional practice committee of the American Diabetes Association, uh, which updates the annual standards of uh, medical care. Um, she has uh, been involved in a number of uh, CME programs and board reviews and other things. So she's very well known and has. Uh, really become a role model. I saw an article in the Lancet in May of this year as uh, uh, talking about her as uh, a, a role model. Um, I think the title was um, The Accidental Role Model, Not by Accident. Um, so uh, I just want to also mention that in August of this year, there were three articles in diabetes talking about uh, the dearth of women in diabetes research. Uh, I think, you know, she's one of the few who has risen up uh, to the top in that. Uh, and there's still a lot of room for women uh, to be part of, um, uh, you know, the growing field of diabetes research. Um, just from um, my perspective, and since she's also of Indian origin, I want to mention that we are right now in the middle of Navratri, which is, celebrates uh, uh, you know, feminine aspects of divinity. And there are three aspects. One is energy or Shakti and wealth, which is uh, Lakshmi. And the third is knowledge, that is uh, Saraswati. And I think, uh, you know, Aroda will uh, kind of uh, represent all three of them. And I ask her to present this talk on preventing or delaying type two diabetes. Wait, wait, don't tell. Oh my goodness. How do I start with that beautiful introduction? Thank you so much, Sri Prakash. Um, it's such an honor to be with you. I'll share with you that when they asked me to do that interview for The Lancet, they wanted to know how is it that a woman could uh, kind of emerge towards the top. These were their words, not mine. And not only that, but how could someone of Indian ancestry? Um, and, you know, it's something that I really thought about because we all focus on what we do day to day. Um, and so it's very humbling to hear this introduction. And thank you for the warm welcome. I really enjoyed my time with the fellows this afternoon and hope we enjoy our time together. These are my disclosures, which I like to think reflect the experience and expertise I've developed within the clinical trial uh, realm. And um, I'm gonna start here of, you know, Dr. Moksha Gundam asked me to present on diabetes prevention. Now, clearly University of Louisville has a reputation and has expertise in diabetes prevention. So why would I be presenting on an area where you already have 
clearly established expertise. You have your CDC certified programs, your ADA certified programs, you have uh, health and wellness employee initiatives, you have a robust diabetes and obesity center. And I hope what I'm able to convey to everyone from different perspectives is that um, there's a different perspective when you are a site investigator on any of the trials. We know that these trials are designed and overseen by the executive committee, the steering committee, the sponsor, but at the heart of any trial journey is that participant investigator relationship, where during the trial, we are, I, I call it the dress rehearsal for what it might be in the real world. We're embarking on this journey. We don't know which arm is gonna win. We don't know whether there will be any safety issues that emerge, um, yet there's hopes that by taking part in that journey, we will better our knowledge and better the future. And so what I'm gonna share with you is, you know, this whole area of diabetes prevention, but from the perspective of a site investigator and some key take-homes and learnings throughout. So this is my eight-step flow on diabetes prevention um, or delay. We'll start off right away. What is the potential scope and impact of prevention? We've all seen these curves. This is from Greg et al. in New England Journal of Medicine showing that the number of complications in individuals with diagnosed diabetes, the events per 10,000, they seem to be getting better. But that's in people who are diagnosed with diabetes. And you could attribute that to you know, improvements in healthcare initiatives and system improvements, you know, getting people on statins but that's in people with diabetes already. However, when you look at the actual number of cases of stroke, of amputation, of end renal disease, these numbers are actually going up. And why is that? The annual numbers are increasing because of the large increase in the number of prevalent cases of diabetes. So even though we have a better handle once they're diagnosed with diabetes, the large burden is because we have an increase in diabetes itself. So the burden of the wide spectrum of complications in those with diabetes will ultimately be influenced by efforts to prevent diabetes. This is why it's at the heart of the issue. So who should we screen and potentially intervene on? I wanna take you back to the analysis that was done even before the DPP was designed. This is what influenced the design of the study. And you know they asked, who is at high risk of progressing from IGT to diabetes? They looked at six prospective studies, the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, Rancho Bernardo, et cetera, et cetera. So really nice representation of different longitudinal studies and said, what are the highest risk factors for, for, for progressing? Surprisingly, age was not. As you can see, you know, people of all ages with IGT were affected and could have high risk of progressing. But where you saw a clear relationship was with body weight or body mass index. The higher the body mass index, the higher the likelihood of progressing from IGT to diabetes. Similarly, for fasting plasma glucose and two-hour plasma glucose, you have a threshold effect where above 100 fasting or above 149 for two hour, that's when your sudden increase in risk is seen. What about other factors? No real difference between men and women, not a major consistent difference in terms of family history, but as you can see in the bottom right, a higher risk of progression in those uh, belonging to ethnic minorities. So this is how the eligibility criteria for the uh, diabetes prevention program was formed. It involved adults above the age of 25, again, not like the traditional view of that diabetes was only an aging disease, so, and it included a younger population as well. And the high risk individuals had to have an elevated fasting glucose and an elevated two-hour post-challenge glucose in response to an oral glucose tolerance test and had to be overweight or obese. There was a focus goal to try to enroll at least 50% from, um, from ethnic minority high-risk populations. Now what the problem is, is even though that's the high-risk population characterized by the diabetes prevention program, who do we characterize as having pre-diabetes clinically? It's just a laboratory diagnosis based on either an elevated fasting glucose or an elevated 2-hour post-challenge, or an elevated A1C with no consideration for body mass index or you know, a combination of these. How can this be a problem? You know, there are lots of debates on this, and I'm hoping to help reconcile that. So is there a problem with this label? You know, part of the um, debate is that, yes, this is a problem, because if you look at the DPP, where it was a high-risk population, 
the overall 10 year likelihood of progressing to diabetes was around 50% or about 2% per year. And so there's a risk of disease labeling many lower risk people for whom no evidence exists. If you look on the right, you know, we say that there's 88 million Americans with um, high risk or prediabetes. And yet, if you look at the population represented by the DPP, it's really only about 10% less than age 65 or about 30% age 65 years and older. And yet, um, you know, all the CDC certified programs like the National DPP or Medicare DPP um, that has laboratory basis of diagnosis, it would include a lot more people. So that's the reason for people having a little bit of hesitation in overusing the term prediabetes. On the other hand, so I've got to present the flip, flip side as well. We know from all uh, longitudinal studies that the higher the hemoglobin A1C, the higher the glycated hemoglobin, the higher the risk of progressing to diabetes, as well as the higher the risk of complications related to diabetes, such as coronary heart disease, stroke, and death. So having this knowledge is important because it's an opportunity to intervene and to prevent, and therefore um, there is value in the diagnosis itself. So I presented both sides. How has the ADA landed on this? The recommendation is that prediabetes is associated with heightened cardiovascular risk. Therefore, we should be screening for and treating modifiable risk factors. And I would leave to you that, you know, remember the continuum and remember that prediabetes represents this part of the continuum where we can um, really focus on cardiovascular risk and prevention or delay of type 2 diabetes. So to treat or not to treat? That's a simple question. Well, um, and my answer will be to treat, but let me talk you, share with you the data again from an investigator perspective. What did we see in 2001? What we saw was, um, I'm sharing this picture. I was a fellow sitting in the fellow's office, minding my own business, when all of a sudden I hear this big clamor and commotion. I step out of the fellow's office and what do I see? I see Dr. Sundar Medallier, Dr. Stephen Edelman, Dr. Robert Henry, all standing in the hallway cheering and celebrating. I said, wait, what's going on? And they said, you know, we've cured diabetes. This is in September of 2001, you know, in my early months of fellowship. And what the DPP found was that compared to placebo, intensive lifestyle intervention could reduce the regression to uh, diabetes by about 58%, and that metformin could do so by 31%. This was based on the development of diabetes based on the annual oral glucose tolerance test or the semi-annual fasting plasma glucose, so not by A1C. Well, um, following the DPP then, um, based on the results, the study was um, ended early and all participants were then offered a modified lifestyle change program because at that point it was no longer ethical to withhold the knowledge that intensive lifestyle um, modification could make a difference. Then um, the DPP OS, Diabetes Prevention Program Outcome Study, was funded where 86% of the eligible cohort decided to continue within the DPP OS. Those who were originally assigned to placebo continued with the modified lifestyle change program. This was via group therapy. Those originally randomized to metformin continued with open label metformin at this time. And those who were in the initial intensive lifestyle group continued with the modified lifestyle change program with intermittent boost uh, classes to, again, um, have a little bit of greater intensity than the rest. What have we now seen at 15 years? You'll see a couple patterns. So you see that this was a very high risk population to begin with. You see that the incidence within the first three years um, with placebo was 11 cases per 100 person years, cut by more than half with lifestyle and a third with metformin. But then what you start seeing from that, you know, three years onwards is um, a convergence of the curve so that the, the incidence rates are actually pretty similar. Um, the incidence rates among all three groups was about 5.9 per 100 person years. When additional analyses were done, they found that this was likely related to what we called exhaustion of the susceptibles, meaning um, the participants who are left to still develop diabetes in the later years were likely the lower risk participants. And you know, those who are likely to benefit, benefited in the, in the early years. 
So at 15 years, um, even though there's a convergence of the curves, you still see a benefit of the initial intervention such that with lifestyle compared to placebo, there's a 27% reduction and with metformin versus placebo, an 18% reduction. Remember that 18%, I'm gonna come back to it later. So what did we tell our participants at that 15 year mark? We said, yay, half of you have not developed diabetes. But I'm gonna tell you that the flip side is, even in the most resourced study in the world on diabetes prevention in this very high risk group, approximately one half still progress to diabetes. So even though we talk about diabetes prevention, realize that even with the greatest support, a majority of still do progress to diabetes. And that's important as we think about um, what the journey is like for the patient. But what we did also find is that at 15 years, the likelihood of a microvascular complication independent of whatever treatment arm they were in was less in those who did not progress to diabetes. So it was about 28% left, left, less. And you'll see a few uh, key kind of tick offs here. So one is in those who didn't progress to diabetes, they had less risk, but also the two key variables were mean A1C and diabetes duration in terms of predicting the likelihood of developing microvascular complications. Furthermore, now this is not the DPP, this is the Daqing Diabetes Prevention Study, where this looked at, uh, this was in China, uh, patients randomized to six years of lifestyle intervention versus control, and these were in patients with impaired glucose tolerance. So again, high risk. And now at 30 years of follow-up, after that six years of intervention, what you see here is the intensive lifestyle intervention did well in all categories. 39% reduction in diabetes, 35% reduction in microvascular complications, 26% reduction in cardiovascular events, 33% reduction in death, 26% reduction in all-cause mortality, and an increase in lifetime by 1.4 years. But when they adjusted for using models to, that took into account the time of onset of diabetes, all of those additional benefits went away, meaning the reduced incidence of all of these long-term outcomes was associated and accounted for by the delay in diabetes onset. So delaying diabetes, even if we don't ultimately prevent it, is still good and has long-term benefit. So to treat or not to treat, uh, we know that diabetes prevention interventions in patients can delay or prevent the progression. Now again, even in the most resourced study, uh, a majority of them at 15 years still do, did progress. However, if you remember those curves, minimizing exposure and progression of hyperglycemia by their absolute level, by the duration, or by the binomial yes-no diabetes was associated with a significant reduction in diabetes-related morbidity and mortality. We're at the halfway point. This is where, um, if you know anybody who was a case manager in the DPP or any of the original PIs, you have to ask them what they did for lifestyle intervention because the papers don't fully represent it. I'm gonna share a little bit with you. I wanna remind you that the DPP was an efficacy study. What does that mean? The efficacy study means that you're performing the intervention under ideal and controlled circumstances. So what was the intervention here? People make the mistake of saying, ah, oh, the intervention was healthy lifestyle, and then we saw how they did. No, the efficacy intervention was to actually achieve and maintain a weight reduction of at least 7%. That was the intervention. And then how? through healthy, low-calorie, low-fat diet, and through um, a moderate intensity activity for at least 150 minutes per week. So that was the mission that every case manager had. It was, you have this participant in the lifestyle arm, you have to reduce their weight through healthy means by 7% and have to get them to exercise 150 minutes a week. It's a little different than just offering lifestyle. All of the participants in the lifestyle intervention group had individual one-on-one -on -one lifestyle coaches and access to one-on-one -on -one dietitian, one-on-one -on -one behavioral counselor, one-on-one -on -one exercise specialist. And it was a 16 session individual curriculum covering the full gamut of nutrition, exercise, and behavioral management. And this was a very selective population. They were selected through a run-in period where every participant had to demonstrate that they could keep food diaries and that they could be compliant with pills for the people who would be ultimately randomized to metformin. So it was a very um, select population to demonstrate uh, whether or not there was efficacy of the intervention. And every case manager had 
a budget, what that we call the toolbox, meaning if your participant wasn't able to get the 115 minutes a week, you could be creative, you know, purchase exercise videos, purchase whatever you thought they needed to be able to get their healthy weight loss of 7% and physical activity. So if you look at some, talk to some of the case managers or uh, to some of the original PIs, you'll hear great stories. So here's a few quotes. The lifestyle participants went through what amounts to a kind of graduate level education in how to change their lives. Nike shoes, gym memberships, grocery vouchers, digital skills. One case manager told me, we even bought one participant a treadmill because again, that was the intervention, get them to exercise 150 minutes per week. Then you know, we even went walking, knocking on people's doors. You know, you have an exercise this week, it's time to go. We did whatever it took. And then um, from this health affairs article, in some respects, the coaches and others in the trial became the federally funded equivalent of nagging relatives determined to keep participants adherent to the trial interventions. Now imagine if we all had the nagging relative who, instead of saying, you know, eat, eat, who actually enforced a 7% weight loss. Now I wanna make a quick point on what the standard arm or the placebo arm received. This is now back in 1996. All the metformin participants and the placebo participants received standard lifestyle, which was written information plus an annual one-on-one -on -one individual session of 20 to 30 minutes. So think about that. That was the standard uh, advice for all of the uh, participants with, you know, uh, in the DPP. Think about what we do nowadays in our busy clinics. Do we even give them this written information plus the one-on-one -on -one session on basics of a healthy food uh, guide on, you know, healthy um, habits? So what does lifestyle intervention look like? We all have our favorite dot phrases in the electronic health record of, yeah, we counseled the patient on a healthy lifestyle, we gave them a handout, but that is not what intensive lifestyle intervention look like in the DPP, and that's not what it should look like. So know and utilize your local resources and support. It really does take a lot of effort to um, incorporate intensive lifestyle intervention. And this is where, again, the CDC programs of which you have one, uh, make all the difference. Also remember, every individual needs the creativity of you know, the toolbox. What is it that will help them really engage in intensive lifestyle intervention? So know your tools, know your resources, know your toolbox. But as a postscript, I will say, even though you know, just general advice may not have been the, the same as in the DPP, here's data from um, the BRFSS showing that when physicians did advise patients with prediabetes, they were more likely to engage in the healthy habits. Here you see that um, as a whole, about 50% performed healthy habits of trying to control or lose, or lose weight, reducing fat or calories, increasing physical activity, but only about a third were advised. But when they were advised to do it, a large majority did follow. So um, it's a balance. What about pharmacotherapy? So I'll focus on metformin again, which is um, the longest studied agent from the Diabetes Prevention Program. So in the ADA standards of care, the recommendation um, and the statements are that, you know, we recognize that none are approved by the FDA specifically for diabetes prevention. The FDA doesn't like um, having an end target where, you know, the intervention itself can, can alter the outcome. Um, however, metformin has the strongest evidence base. And if you look at the DPP, the populations where it looked like metformin had the greatest benefit were especially in those who were obese with a BMI of 35 or greater, those less than the age of 60, and in women with prior gestational diabetes. So here's a publication that I was a part of where we looked at the 10-year cumulative incidence of diabetes in women with, with or without a history of gestational diabetes. And as you can see from the placebo curve in red, um, women in placebo, this gives you the natural look and the natural history of the likelihood of progression in those with a history of gestational diabetes. And you can see that the risk is quite high. Those in the placebo group had a 65% higher risk of developing diabetes compared to women without a history of gestational diabetes. And when we look at the interventions, here, unlike what was seen in the whole study, with the focus of the 250 women um, with GDM, we see that metformin and lifestyle have comparable risk reductions of about 40% with no significant difference between lifestyle or metformin. So this is a 
catchment population where um, both um, perform equally well. <clears throat> in, the, in 2019, the DPPOS put this very practical, pragmatic paper um, together and published it, trying to characterize which of our patients should we really be thinking about metformin, um, not instead of, but you know, maybe as adjunct to um, lifestyle therapy. So they looked at the rate difference, which is the absolute effect between metformin and placebo, calculated as the number of diabetes events divided by the total number of person years of follow-up to try to get a sense. Now on the left, what you see is diabetes defined by glucose criteria, which is how it was done in the DPP based on fasting glucose and 2 r plus challenge glucose. On the right is diabetes characterized by A1C criteria, which is what we do more contemporarily in clinical practice. So you see that there's a couple differences. By age, um, by the traditional DPP criteria, you can see that metformin really only benefited those less than the age of 60. However, when you look at people, um, when you look at diagnosis by A1C, age doesn't matter. All groups benefited. Similarly, um, when we looked at the original DPP subgroup population based on glucose criteria, you can see that there seems to be a greater benefit um, in those with a BMI of 35 or more. However, when you look at diabetes defined by A1C criteria, again, they were all pretty comparable. And a very consistent picture that high fasting plasma glucose, whether you do it by glucose criteria or by A1C, high 2-hour glucose, high A1C, yes, no, history of gestational diabetes are all uh, populations where there seems to be a benefit with metformin. To give, you, to give you an example of practical numbers, if you look at the supplement of this paper, for a patient with gestational diabetes with an elevated fasting glucose of above 110, you could reduce 10 cases per 100 person years by treating that person with metformin. Again, giving, you, giving us a sense of a population health indicator. So how do we put this all together? Even though no agent has a label indication specifically for diabetes prevention, we have the longest term evidence for metformin with particular benefit in the younger age groups and the higher BMI within the DPP. But then if you look at either glucose or A1C criteria, those with a higher fasting glucose, a higher A1C, and definitely the uh, women with the history of gestational diabetes um, as characterized in the DPP. So now that we have our, we've identified our patient with um, high risk of progressing to diabetes, We've seen the benefits. We've seen what it takes for lifestyle intervention. We've seen um, the long-term outcomes with metformin. Are there any clinically relevant targets that may guide treatment? You know, what do we actually tell our patients? And this is where I, I think, again, is kind of my title of this talk, is no matter what way we look at it and no matter what way you look at the long terms, weight is a huge factor. So if you look um, in the lifestyle intervention group, it was the magnitude of weight loss that translated to the diabetes uh, benefit. So every kilogram of weight loss was associated with a 16% reduction in risk of diabetes. Now, one kilogram is not that much, but um, you know what, what we saw in the uh, DPP was about, again, 7%. So that translates to your uh, greater risk of reduction. Even in the metformin group, when modeling was done to try to explain the benefit of metformin, you see that 64% of metformin's effect was explained by weight loss. Now, over 15 years, what you see on the right is that the metformin group has sustained its weight loss of about two to three kilograms, and it's about one, kilo, one to two kilograms greater than what's seen in the placebo arm in red. And what did I say um, was the metformin? Uh, diabetes risk reduction, it was about 18% at 15 years, similar to that one kilogram of weight loss. So I, I think people underestimate the power of weight loss in the natural trajectory of diabetes. The other really insightful thing from the Diabetes Prevention Program is they looked at whether anyone ever achieved normal glucose regulation during the DPP and what the uh, ramifications or implications were. And they found that if anyone ever received, uh, achieved normal glucose at any single point, just once during the DPP, they had a 56% lower risk of progressing to diabetes, whether or not they were in the placebo arm, metformin arm, or lifestyle arm. 
and there was a lower aggregate of microvascular complications, specifically nephropathy and retinopathy, um, for anyone who achieved a normal glucose at least once during the DPP. And that this association in terms of protection for complications was lost when they did the modeling for glucose. So the lower risk, again, is attributed to lower glycemic exposure. Now this is important, I think, and it has contemporary relevance because if you look at the therapies that we have that are starting to emerge nowadays, this is the once weekly semaglutide in adults with overweight or obesity that was published in New England Journal of Medicine in March this year. Here we are seeing weight loss on the order of 15%. And you know, with the majority of participants achieving 5%, 10%, or even 15% weight loss. And if you look at the subgroups of participants with prediabetes in this study, 84% achieved normal glycemia on medication at week 68. So I think this is where you know, the, the DPP longitudinal data of the association of a lower weight or a higher magnitude of weight loss translating to greater benefit and greater normalization of glucose translating to greater benefit or long-term has um, significant therapeutic implications. Now, I've shared with you that a majority of participants at by 15 years, over 50% still progress to diabetes. So now the next question is, once they progress to diabetes, does glucose still matter? And here is data from the Diabetes and Aging Study from Latira Pongetel, uh, published in Diabetes Care. And they found that within that first year, compared to those with an A1C of less than 6.5%, um, those who had an A1C above 6.5% had a higher risk of microvascular complications, macrovascular complications, and mortality. They then looked at the exposure from zero to one year, zero to two years, zero to three years, all the way to zero to seven years. And guess what? They found the exact same thing, that um, being able to, even within that first time period, that early time period where a lot of times, you know, people's control actually escapes, but being able to get people and keep people at goal less than 6.5% translated to less risk of microvascular, macrovascular, and mortality over time. And as you can see, over time, when you get to the zero to seven years, the risk amplifies even more um, as you get to higher A1C levels. So putting this together, are there clinically relevant targets? You know, sometimes weight doesn't sound so sexy, but that, that really is where it's at. It's about weight and it's about glucose. So weight loss, including the magnitude of weight loss, really explained much of the reduction and delay in diabetes that was seen. And you can see uh, the, the resurgence in weight in the lifestyle group. Again, it, it's hard and it's something that we have to think about over the long term. And the second, back to basics, is minimizing exposure to hyperglycemia. Even a single return to normal glucose regulation can, was associated with a reduction in long-term complications. So when we think about glucose, again, it's whether or not they progress to diabetes, that binomial, the absolute level, and the absolute duration. And these are clinical markers that we should be using as we uh, translate the evidence to care. So now, as a little bit of a bonus in my last few areas, I actually, I understand Professor Winters is in the audience, and we've never met, but I, I, I want to say thank you to the University of Louisville, because um, part of the joy of being part of these large collaborative uh, clinical trial groups is you're not only um, privy to what happens to, you know, at the bedside with the participants, but you are able to uniquely po uh, poise and ask questions of interest and you know, look at data and look at all the different offshoots. So one of the areas that um, I was charged with was, um, and this is based on having written some of the proposals in this area, was whether there is a uh, relationship between sex hormone binding globulin and diabetes risk in the diabetes prevention program. And so I, um, you'll see I, I turn to the literature of uh, Professor Winter's publications for, for guidance there. So just by way of background, we've seen now in long um, epidemiologic studies that sex hormone binding globulin is reported to be inversely proportional to diabetes risk. So this is the Ding et al. paper published in New England Journal of Medicine in 2009, looking at the women's health study and the physician's health study as case control cohorts, looking at patients who ultimately were diagnosed with type 2 diabetes compared to controls. And what you can see here is when you look at sex hormone binding globulin by quartiles, those in the highest quartile, group four, 
had the lowest risk of progressing to type 2 diabetes, even um, after adjusting for many of the factors, not, not all of them, but many of the factors that one would think about. And this was consistent in both men and women. And they also looked at unique SNPs as well and found an association um, with certain SNPs and the, uh, and the SHBG, SHBG levels and the risk of type 2 diabetes. So in the diabetes prevention program, we did look at baseline SHBG and longer-term risk, and we really couldn't see an association that stood the test of time after adjustment. We then looked at, well, okay, how does SHBG levels get modified with the interventions? And this is the data that we found, and we uh, published it uh, this last year. And what you can see here in the green curves are the lifestyle intervention um, arms in blue is placebo and orange is metformin. And in males and premenopausal women, you can see that with lifestyle, you have less of a decline in the sex hormone binding globulin uh, compared to the other groups. And in postmenopausal women, this is without hormone replacement therapy, we had an increase in the sex hormone binding globulin levels. So this um, seemed kind of uh, promising that, oh, okay, maybe lifestyle intervention is increasing sex hormone binding globulin and that's somehow then uh, related to the decreased risk of diabetes. Well, we then, you know, looked at it method methodically, and um, here's the adjustment models that we did. Model one, we adjusted for, you know, typical demographic and baseline factors. I'm just highlighting the postmenopausal group because that's the easiest to follow um, because of the positive uh, relationship with lifestyle. We then adjusted for sex hormones. There's still a relationship, but the moment you adjust for adiposity and glucose measures, that relationship disappears. And sure enough, after adjusting for everything, um, there really was no uh, association between the standard deviation change in sex hormone binding globulin and the long-term uh, three-year diabetes risk. And so our big conclusion was that, you know, we really can't replace um, adiposity and our typical glucose measures. Um, and this goes back to the patient population that we had in the DPP. This was the highest of high risk, so fairly homogeneous in their high risk in that they all had IGT, they all had indicating you know, evidence of insulin resistance, they all had elevated fasting glucose, they were all overweight or obese. Now, it took me a year to write the discussion because you know, these models, you know, lines going up, lines going down, how do, you, how do you make sense of this? So I went back to my very first research project that I did with Dr. Henry um, at the University of California, San Diego, in the VA in San Diego, where we looked at women uh, with PCOS, and, you know, I was the one that recruited all the women. We did the clamp studies, we did muscle biopsies, adipose biopsies. This was 23 women. They were randomized to placebo or pioglitazone, you know, the true insulin sensitizer. What you can see in panel A at the top was, um, you know, an increase in the glucose disposal rate by clamp studies. And then adiponectin as a marker of insulin sensitivity, an increase in adiponectin. And the one marker that seemed to track with insulin resistance uh, very consistently, more so than sex hormones, more so than anything else, was the sex hormone binding globulin. So the baseline correlation tracked with the baseline insulin sensitivity uh, by uh, the clamp, and the change in GDR uh, correlated with a change in the circulating sex hormone binding globulin. So, uh, and as you all know, pioglitazone doesn't cause weight loss. In fact, uh, the woman uh, randomized to pioglitazone um, uh, gained weight, which is what we know about thiazolidine dione. So here there is a direct relationship with improving insulin sensitivity and improving sex hormone binding globulin levels. Then I read through uh, Professor Winters' paper looking at um, sex hormone binding globulin mRNA expression from human liver samples um, from 55 adult men and women undergoing hepatic resection, I presume from the University of Louisville. Louisville and found that there's a direct correlation between the circulating serum levels and the expression of mRNA from the hepatic samples, and that these, the expression was directly correlated to, again, levels of insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity, and that there was a direct relationship with the transcription factor, HNF4 alpha, and that the correlations, as you can see, in men and women were all tightly connected to, um, what, what have I said? 
measures of adiposity, and measures of glucose or insulin resistance. And concluding that fat accumulation in the liver and insulin res resistance are important determinants of SHBT gene expression. So only after revisiting my fellowship days and you know, pouring through this, this one paper over and over again, finally did my discussion make sense where, you know, aha, uh -huh, uh, the, the way I conceptualize it is the liver really is the metabolic barometer of the study. And I kind of pictured the, the liver looking out at the window and, you know, it, it can sense and, you know, it, it's, it is the metabolic barometer sensing the circulating insulin resistance as well as adiposity through, you know, its own adiposity as well. And that the SHBG that we're seeing is dynamically changing up and down um, as kind of the output of that. So I, I wanted to say thank you for taking, helping me get through writing that discussion, which took me a year to do so. So now, and, and I also wanted to share a little sliver of kind of the example of publications that come from the, the large uh, collaborative clinical trials, where if you just have a question and have an area of interest, as I went over with the fellows today, um, it, things start getting exciting and they, they start making sense. Now, where do I want to end this? I've taken you through the, you know, why is it important to even think about preventing and delaying diabetes? Who should we screen? Who should we treat? What does intervention look like? But now let's take it back to the person. You know, what do we do day in and day out when we counsel patients on preventing diabetes? We, we focus on the medical model, you know, calories in, calories out, physical activity. And yet the reality is, is that we all live in a socio-ecological model that there are sectors of influence, whether it be cultural, you know, the, uh, Dr. Moksha Gundam mentioned the festivals. We all know that during Indian festivals, what's the key thing to have are the, are the mitai, the sweets. So there are cultural influences, work influences, social norms and values that need to be targeted and that we need to look a little bit more broadly. So this is a slide that has no data, it just has pictures, but just to give you a sense of you know, the challenges that we face. If we look at from 1950s to, to the you know, 1990s, portion sizes have increased significantly. There are food deserts. It costs $6 for a cup of carrots from the airport as opposed to $1 for uh, processed food. Um, you know, our built environment is very different. There's been a lot of urbanization and, um, you know, less of the walkable uh, towns. If we look at our exports around the world, our greatest export, unfortunately, is you know not the healthiest of exports. So uh, there's a lot of westernization in other countries where we're starting to see again um, the epidemics that follow. Even you know if you go back to the 1960s, housework was where we uh, where people got a lot of physical activity, whether it was you know hand doing the laundry, do, doing the vacuuming, and now we've got a lot of automation in our lives to take care of some of that physical labor. This is, you know, this is just me a few years ago going to the neighborhood Patel Brothers and, you know, what are they advertising for our sweets? But what I want to show you is growing up, uh, Dr. Munchik and them asked me if you know, I've ever been to India. We would go to India every few years and every time I would go, the term that they would use to describe to my mom is, you know, she doesn't look healthy enough because the term for chubby kids or overweight kids was healthy. Again, taking taking in, into a historical context where there's probably the more overweight kids that survive. So there are a lot of cultural influences. This is the Venus of Cupertino where we all have, you know, are glued to some kind of technology using screen. And there's, you know, one of my daughters, of course, uh, screen time is, is associated with bad eating habits. And, you know, who are we kidding? We don't have to look very far. We're all together here on Zoom. 70 slides don't come together by, you know, throwing Frisbee at the park, uh, you know, we, we get glued and then, you know, our family starts learning that maybe Sunday afternoon is time to sit at the computer and set it in slides. But we do our best. We try to expose and, you know, battle some of these influences when we know uh, what is going on. And here's my office where I am right now, where, you know, I have the treadmill desk and, you know, trying to uh, make sure that we do the best we can. So. In 2013, as part of the Prevention Committee, um, I was a senior author where we put together the first American Diabetes Association scientific statement addressing and trying to understand the socio-ecological determinants of prediabetes and diabetes. And I would just want to share with you the call to action and the conclusion that to date, we have focused on the medical model, which again, calories in, calories out, 
but to really make an impact uh, on a broad scale, we have to be thinking about our social ecological influences, you know, and intertwine the public health approach, looking at where we live, how we live, where we learn, where we work, in order to support healthy behavior and what it really takes to prevent and delay diabetes in order to have an impact, not just on diabetes, but on all the later complications that I've shared with you. And for my final, final bonus, what do you do day in and day out with the patient in front of you? I am sharing with you the conversations not to have. These are exact conversations that I witnessed or I've been part of, and it's a misinterpretation of the data. So for example, you know, your lab suggests that you have increased risk of diabetes, a condition we call prediabetes. You should make healthier fluid choices, increase physical activity, goal of 150 minutes per week, lose 7%. That all sounds fine, it's all evidence-based. I'll see you in six months. If you're not able to do this, we'll need to put you on a medicine. So it's not either or, it's not using medicine as a threat. I've already shared with you that even in the most well-resourced study uh, in high-risk patients, it's still a majority progress. Or here, <laughs> this is my favorite because I know we all can relate and I know all of us are guilty of doing this at one time or another. Yep, your labs show worsening levels. I advise you to lose weight. You know, people in the DPP, they were able to do this and they could prevent diabetes. If you don't make changes, you will get diabetes and we'll have to put you on the medicine. No, or you know, you didn't know diabetes is preventable. Of course, your doctor should have told you about that. They could have told you to lose weight. They could have told you to take metformin. You could have prevented your diagnosis of diabetes. And oh, so how do we translate this conversation to care? And I'm just giving you an example snippet of you know, fully internalizing the entire data and 20 year journey that I've shared with you. That, you know, we see that your lab suggests an increased risk of developing diabetes. This tells us that we should monitor you more closely, pay more attention to your long-term risks of diabetes and heart disease, and to try to keep your blood sugar values as close to normal over time as safely as possible and to address your weight as well. Studies have shown that losing modest amount of weight through healthy lifestyle changes can delay or, um, prevent the progression. We have a lot of resources, know your resources. It takes a lot. I showed you what intensive lifestyle really took and that we have equally important, we have medications that have been studied in large programs that we can consider and we'll monitor your glucose and weight over time to consider when and how to intensify therapy to keep you at goal, to prevent that es escape. And this is just an example, but you know your culture, you know your environment, you know your surroundings. Think about how you might internalize the data because so much gets lost in translation. And that's that's what I'm hoping that I shared with you today is you know the perspective of a site investigator and how to you know internalize some of this data. So in a talk called Preventing Type 2 Diabetes, um, what are the final take-homes? What are the goalposts? I'll tell you that I don't, well, you'll see here, I don't have preventing diabetes as the goalpost. I have weight management, because the weight does translate to the greater risk in the long run. I have minimizing progression of an exposure to hyperglycemia. That could be by progressing to diabetes as one factor, but progression of the levels and the duration. So keeping it un under control with the ultimate goal of a healthier life free of complications. And I think I've ended right on the dot. Um, just wanna say thank you to mentors near and far, those of you who I haven't met, but we all influence each other through our publications and, and writing. And um, I'll leave it open for questions and thank you. Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Aroda. Um, I'll invite uh, anyone to ask questions. You can either uh, type in your questions in the chat or you can use your uh, microphone to ask a question. Yeah, could could I ask a question, of Stanley Levinson? Sure. Um, uh, it, it seems to me, and and I'm sorry, but my questions are often too long to type, so I'd rather ask it. But it seems to me that patients or the public should be aware that excess fat tissue is toxic. It's like having a poison in you. 
Uh, and, you know, the information comes from every part of medicine, the heart studies, the uh, metabolic studies, the kidney studies, the liver studies, the endocrine studies. Uh, and, and there should be some focus on the toxicity that excess fat tissue causes. Could, could you think, comment on that? I think, I think that's such a great point, uh, Dr. Levinson. And again, as a field, I think we've treated diabetes in its own silo and obesity and fat in its own silo for way too long. And, you know, the discussing adiposity is a sensitive issue for a lot of patients, but I think, you know, we can, we cannot ignore it. That when the body doesn't know what to do with this excess fat, that's when bad things happen. Um, so I think it's a, it's a valid, valid point. And I do think that we're, we're going to do a better job at, you know, unifying the two areas. And I'd be welcome to your comments and, and thoughts on this as well. So one of the things that we have um, a problem with is getting people to participate in these programs. And, you know, that has been the criticism, I think, uh, across the board for the DPP style intervention. Uh, many of the DPP lights don't work, you know. <laughs> you have to have all these things. Uh, so what is your, uh, you know, approach to yeah. making this more, you know, uh, applicable? So you saw what it took and you saw that the moment we took away that intensive one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. what happened to weight? It all came, I mean, not all, you know, sands one to two kilograms but it came back, it really did take an intensive effort, but it was doable. Um, unfortunately, again, going back to the social ecological model, there's just so many influences in our environment and, and lives that, you know, kind of battle what the fat cell wants to do. <laughs> um, and again, to your point, Sri Prakash, is if you look at attendance rates at some of the you know, diabetes prevention programs, you know, they're maybe 15 to 20 percent, and um, it, it's not it's not easy. So I, I think um, the more we can educate patients on what it really takes and what it really took, and level set, I think the better off we'll be. But I I, I do think that. Um, if you look at the CDC materials that came out of the DPP, it oversimplified the issue, and I don't want to criticize anyone, but, you know, you look at the CDC handouts on diabetes prevention, and there's a pair of sneakers and there's a you know, celery stock, but it took much more than that. Yeah. I think Professor Winters is speaking. I can't hear. So there is a question in the chat. Oh, has the pandemic increased type 2 diabetes incidence? Great, great question. And I think that's a right question for one of the fellows to solve. Um, some of the fellows were looking for research projects. What is the evidence, if any, for being able to reverse type 2 diabetes? Oh, excellent question. So the direct study, they took patients who were, you know, fairly recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and um, randomized them to intensive weight reduction through meal replacements. And sure enough, what do you see? You see a remission of diabetes with a reduction in uh, weight. So remission is possible, but it, the greatest remission is with your greatest weight loss, such as with you know, bariatric surgery. So it's, it's tied. What was the name of that study you just mentioned? Direct, D-I-R-E-C-T. Thank you. Do digital DPP programs work? Um, you know, there's meta-analyses on these, and again, I think um, the, it, there are certain CDC, you know, there are certain certified programs. I would like to say what works is what, what the individual will do. So to have programs available to cater to the very taste, I think, is a good thing. I still can't hear Dr. Winters. But I hope it's something good. <laughs> I don't know if he's hearing you either, you know. <laughs> so the, you had this data of the A1C versus the glucose. Was there an ethnic difference or racial difference in, in that? 
Um, so if we look at the original DPP criteria, um, there was really no difference in the effective interventions by race or ethnicity. So what worked in Native Americans worked, you know, lifestyle was universal. And, um, you know, similarly in, with the A1C data as well. So there's some suggestion that the A1C is, the A1C glucose correlation is better with Caucasians than with African Americans. Yeah, but it's an excellent point. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm sorry, Dr. Winters, it doesn't look like we can hear you. So if you look at the, um, the look ahead, used a similar protocol, correct? Yes, so there too, again, a little nugget for you. And I, I'm gonna mention this, I think in Medicine Grand Rounds tomorrow. Even though the look ahead study was negative in terms of showing a difference in cardiovascular complications between those who had intensive lifestyle education with type two diabetes versus standard, if you look at those who had at least a 10% weight loss within the first year, guess what? There was less cardio, there was a 24% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes. Now that was a post hoc analysis, but again, I think for the last few decades, we've just kind of, to Dr. Levinson's initial point, we, we haven't integrated the, the weight picture enough. So my thing is like, if you're starting with the DPP and you develop diabetes, and then you're still in the DPP, you're going into the look ahead, <laughs> correct? Yeah. You know? and so you should sustain it, then you will get benefits. But, and you know, the challenge is how, right? It's, yeah. we've mm -hmm. all seen patients um, progress and this is where, you know, if I could go back and talk to myself from 10 years ago, I would have done things differently. And this is this is what we get to witness as endocrinologists. But the earlier we can engage and integrate these meaningful changes and, you know, jump on as needed to make sure that we're minimizing the progression of hyperglycemia and, and weight, I, I think the better we'll be off for the long run. And what about, can we use SHBG as a marker? SHBG, that's a, it's an interesting point. So uh, I talked about, you know, in women with PCOS, there, there are publications, you know, suggesting that SHBG might be a good biomarker. But what, I, what I'll tell you is, I, and I'm interested in hearing what Dr. Winters has to say, I think it's just a reflector, reflector of adipose adiposity and insulin sensitivity. So I think it might it it might find a place, but I don't think it replaces that which we already have access to. Is there it any, might be um, easier when you're looking at a biomarker instead of mm -hmm. talking about weight. What do you think? Well I mean I think it should be a biomarker, you know. <laughs> Uh, it should be able to. I mean, although, you know, there are other variables and, uh, <laughs> that determine this, you know. So how about SGLT2 inhibitors? So this is, this is where I get to advertise tomorrow's talk. But, you know, that's a great point. There's a publication in Diabetes Care in um, looking at the one of the dapagliflozin studies. And what they found is in people with prediabetes, those who are on dapagliflozin, there was a less likelihood of developing diabetes. Now, this is on medication, so, you know, you could debate that. But not only that, but there was a numerical suggestion of a cardiovascular benefit in that um, reduction. So I, I think it get, goes back to that very simple message that I hope I've conveyed is that um, early control makes the difference. And there's probably other mechanistic things that play with the SGLT2 inhibitors. Great. Start up from the second one. Anything else? All set? 
Anyone else with any question? My appreciation to everyone. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming to this talk. We'll see you again tomorrow.